Uh, now I will request our guest of honor, Adamgaran sir, uh, to tell us about uh, his experience and his word of wisdom is always uh, useful for all professional and in, in the corporate world. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me as a part of this program. I know that I indicated to you I have a hard exit at 4.30 and you said, nevertheless, I will be fitted into the program. So thank you very much. I think you and your colleagues are doing outstanding work in promoting education because having good laws is not enough. It's important to help people to understand the law so that their actions are on the right side of the law and do not add to the regulatory and the enforcement burdens. The 2013 Act is clearly far more relevant to our times than the 1956 Act ever could have been. In that sense, it's a sig very significant improvement. Uh, but it took 57 years for the 1956 Act to become a part of history. Uh, I hope we don't wait for another 57 years because the world is changing rapidly. Changes in the corporate environment are very rapid and therefore we need to have laws and regulations that are of contemporary relevance rather than of historical value. The second big point that I want to make is that laws are a means to an end. Laws are not an end in itself. We got to have clarity about what that end is. And that end clearly is, how can you facilitate legitimate conduct of business while coming down heavily and quickly on those that are stepping out of line? So the major objective is, how do you create an environment in which the laws and regulations make it easy for good, honest businessmen to carry on business without having too many obstacles or hurdles erected in the way. And that is the philosophy that ought to inform lawmaking. That is the philosophy that ought to guide persons who are in the business of not just enacting laws or writing regulations, but even implementing them. Because if you don't have the right mindset, you will end up penalizing the wrong guys and allowing the other persons to get away, those that need to be punished. I'll touch on a few things which I think are positive. First is, I think, the decriminalization of minor offenses. That's a huge positive. There's been an area of concern for many, many years post the coming into force of the act that every minor transgression was treated as a criminal offense affecting penal consequences. Significant ground has been covered in that space but I would imagine that there is a lot more that can be done if we look at this not as a criminal law, but as substantially a civil law to facilitate the conduct of business. So that is something that needs to be done. At the same time, repeated defaulters will be visited with heavier penalties, and that is a very welcome provision. The definition of the small company, as well as the introduction of the LLPs, I think, positive because these have been around for a while but needed to have a kind of legal recognition. Gender diversity in the boardrooms is good. Have we traveled far enough? No. Diversity is not gender diversity and we need to look at other forms of diversity to see that the board does not become, uh, while it is a seat of wisdom, it does not become a meeting place for old people, some of whom might have lost contact with contemporary realities. And therefore, you need age diversity, you need geographical diversity, you need several other diversities, not just uh, diversity on the basis of gender. Auditor rotation, again, is a very welcome provision. I've been advocating this, I think, since the mid-90s. And I thought cozy relationships had developed between auditors and audited entities. And therefore, the ability to tell the truth like it is, which tends to get in some sense blunted over time by continuing the same auditor, is a matter that has been addressed. Have we traveled 
far enough? Is five plus five good because 10 years is a long time? I know the usual arguments will be trotted out about domain familiarity, understanding the company, having the bandwidth, not too many audit firms have the bandwidth, all of that. I think we can work around all of that to see that you get a little faster rotation in auditors and not five plus five, 10 years. Uh, LCLT is a good provision, but somehow uh, the intentions are honorable. Is it working out the way it was intended to work out? I think the jury is still out of that. And anyone who says it's doing a great job is clearly making a statement that is politically right and not uh, factually consistent with what we get to see. The big misses, NFRA again is a very good uh, inclusion, largely because it was felt that a business body cannot be a regulator, cannot be enforcing conduct rules among its members because there is some kind of a conflict of interest, no matter how you compose the disciplinary committee, there is a conflict of interest that will remain if the body that represents the business interests is also the body that is tasked with regulation. And therefore, NFRA, I think, is a very good addition. Early days yet to see how it will play out. I'm not one of those who believe that regulatory organizations should be judged in a few years. You should look at 10, 15 years to see whether they have stood the test of time. Now, the major misses, according to me, I think it was a huge omission in the 2013 Act, not to include the Risk Management Committee as a mandatory committee. You didn't have to wait for SEBI to bring it into being through the LODR, because today it is at least as important as the other four, which are mandated by the Companies Act. And therefore, whenever a change takes place, I think it's useful to bring the RMC into legislation rather than keep it in the regulations of say Provisions on RPT have been changing so rapidly. Some amount of synchronization needs to be worked out so that those that do not have the right intentions do not go in for regulatory arbitrage, looking at whether the Companies Act has the lighter provisions or SEBI has, and then trying to take advantage. So there should be an ongoing attempt and firstly, an ongoing conversation to see that as far as the listed entities are concerned, there is no major difference between the Companies Act and the, uh, the uh, maybe LODR. Then I come to CSR, which is the last point I'm conscious of time. CSR, when it was introduced, we were told was a comply or explain provision. This concept was imported from the United Kingdom where because you had enlightened shareholders that could ask the right questions, it was believed that a company not measuring up could be able to bring a satisfactory explanation to the HEM so that shareholders are able to sit in judgment on that. We introduced Corex only for CSR in the Companies Act 2013. But what has happened since then worries me a little. It became comply or explain after that became comply or explain to the government and the regulators who started issuing letters on why haven't you measured up to 2%? Why are you doing this? Why are you not doing that? I think the time has come to go back to the origins of Corex comply or explain to shareholders and other stakeholders and government should prescribe what goes into CSR and then step back rather than looking at is it 2%, is it 1.5%, do you need to create a separate fund for that so that the uh, unspent amount is spent next year. But these are areas which I think the government can stay out of. Two last points. One, the entire law, and just not the Companies Act, but all laws, have over time been premised on the fact that businessmen cannot be trusted. I think it's important, follow the principle, trust but verify, rather than distrust and crucify, which seems to be holding the ground at this point of time. 
Your survey indicated, the first slide of your survey, that 41% of the respondents felt that they were not entirely happy with what the company is like. It's true that the majority felt it was good, but if 41% are dissatisfied, I think there is a need for a meaningful consultative exercise to see where that dissatisfaction resides and how to address it. My very last point, laws and regulations, I believe this is an article of faith with me, must be written in simple language. Can we revisit some of those provisions? My favorite example is the definition of fraud in the explanation to section 447. I think it should be written in six simple sentences rather than the complicated sentence in which it is written. I am out of time. I have reminders for my next meeting. Thank you, Pavan, for the opportunity. Uh, but to sum up, Companies Act is good legislation. In parts, it makes the 1956 Act better. There's no doubt about that in some parts, but too few parts. But there is a lot of work to be done. Legislate in haste and you know, regret that leisure is not such a good idea. So which were happened with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in the US. Legislated very quickly and then went back and repented at leisure. We need to revisit some of the provisions so that contemporary relevance is ensured on a continuing basis without erecting unnecessary obstacles in the way of people that want to do business legitimately. Thank you very much.